Let's pray. Let's look at that passage from Exodus 19 together. Lord God, we praise you for the gift of your word. We pray that uh, you would give us soft ears, open ears, soft hearts, to hear your word spoken to us this morning. And uh, your spirit would be present among us. You would be shaping our lives to live in light of your word. We pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now the term covenant is, I think, a key term or idea in the Bible. Despite this, I don't think it's always fully understood what the Bible means by a covenant. Um, I do personally believe that the, the, the covenant is the defining and unifying concept of the whole of the scriptures. Ultimately, at the heart, a covenant is an agreement or a promise between two parties. And the covenant in the Bible specifically is the promise of God to his people that he will be their God and they will be his people. A covenant is not so dissimilar from a marriage in regards to it is an agreement between two parties to the exclusion of all others. This week coming on Thursday, I'll be taking my first wedding since coming here, uh, here in this building. And I'll ask both the bride and the groom this question. I'll say, forsaking all others, do you promise to be faithful to each other as long as you both shall live? Now that marriage vow gets at the heart of what a covenant is all about. And in Exodus 19 this morning, we're introduced to the Mosaic Covenant. That is the covenant that God makes between Israel and himself through Moses on Mount Sinai. It is, of course, the covenant that, that is begun there and points forward to and foreshadows the new covenant that is its fulfillment with Jesus in the New Testament. So chapter, Exodus chapter 19 is a hugely significant chapter in the whole Bible. And to help us to get to grips with it this morning, we're going to look at it through three different headings. Looking at the covenant from the past, from the present, and from the future. From the past, with regards to what God has done. From the present, with regard to what his people must do. And with regard to the future, what his people will be. So first of all, the covenant from the past, what God has done. Look at verse 4 again. God's speaking here and he says, You yourselves have seen what I did in Egypt, how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. See, this covenant starts with God. Notice what's happened in Exodus so far. Israel has been in slavery in Egypt. And it's not been the case that God has come to them and said, Look, obey these laws and do these things, and when you've done that, I'll come and save you. That's not what happened, is it? God came to his people who were unable to save themselves, and he brought them out from Egypt and saved them. And only later afterwards does he give them the law to follow. Sometimes people think there's a, there's a distinction or a conflict between the Old Testament and the New Testament, as if the Old Testament was about commandments and obedience and law, and the New Testament is about faith and grace and mercy. But of course, that's not what we've seen in Exodus, is it? Exodus is the story of grace. God saving his people who can't save themselves from Egypt. And getting this us understanding that this is how God works in his covenant with us is so important. Because the same is true for us. God doesn't come to us and say, follow these commands. Love your neighbour more. Give more to the poor. And then once you've done that, I'll bless you and I'll take you to heaven. That's not what God does, is it? That's not the gospel. That's a completely different religion altogether. Now, the gospel is what we've seen foreshadowed here in Exodus. It starts with God. With God saving his people 
who can't save themselves. Or as the, the New Testament puts it this way, it says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God didn't wait until we'd sorted ourselves out before he sent his son. He sent him to us knowing that he needed to take the initiative. He needed to accomplish this for us. In many ways, you can split all the religions in the world that ever have been or ever will be into two types. There are two-letter and four-letter religions. Christianity is the only four-letter religion. All other religions are a two-letter religion. That is a religion that says do, D-O, do. Do this, or do that, or do the other, and then God will bless you. But you've got to do that. Christianity is a four-letter religion. It says done, D-O-N-E. God has done everything for you through the death and resurrection of Jesus. That's the first thing we learn about covenant. It's about the past, what God has done already. And only, therefore, secondly, is a covenant about the present, what his people must do. That's verse 5. Now, if you obey me and fully keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. All covenants in the Bible come with commands or stipulations for God's people to follow. As mentioned and made clear, I hope, those commands aren't a means of earning God's favour. God loves his people anyway. Now the commands are what come out of a people who are in a loving relationship with God. Consider children. Just had the children at the front here. Children, when they're good children, <laughs> they love to obey their parents. Not to earn their parents' love or favour. They know that their parents love them anyway. But that's what it means to be a child. Or consider marriage. Now, I try to take the bins out for Rebecca, and I try to clear up all the dog poo on the lawn for Rebecca. I try and do those things, not because I'm worried if I don't, she will stop loving me. I know she loves me. I do those things because I love her. You see, obedience flows out of a relationship of love. It doesn't earn love in the first place. And likewise, when we are in a covenant relationship with God, we love to please him. Jesus himself said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. It flows out from a loving relationship. It doesn't create the loving relationship in the first place. Now, of course, we don't always fully understand how these commands that we're to follow are always relevant or necessarily good. For example, I still don't quite get why Rebecca wants me to put my dirty washing in the washing basket in the bathroom rather than just on the floor by my bed. I struggle to understand that. It seems like it's a much better place for it, just by my bed. But anyway, even though I struggle with that, to understand that, I do try. I do try to do that. Although, when I was preaching this exact same sermon earlier in Holcott, Josiah dobbed me in uh, from the congregation and said, no, you just put them straight on the floor by your bed. I always come in the room and they're always there. Thankfully, he's gone to the kids' group now, so <laughs> there we go. No more back chat from him. But consider this passage. We probably struggle with, with what's go the commands that are going on in this passage. Israel's to make themselves clean, to cleanse themselves, to not approach the mountain. There's all this concentration on the commands that they are to keep before they meet the presence of God. And we probably look at that and are wondering, what on earth is going on here? It seems very weird and unnecessary. But of course, when we understand who God is, God is the holy creator of the cosmos, God Almighty, then we realise, don't we, those who are in a relationship with him are to be his holy people. And that's what it means here. And we'll consider that a little bit more next week when we come to the, the end of our series in Exodus next week, of Exodus 20. We'll look at the Ten Commandments and think about what does it mean 
to be obedient to God, to follow his commands when we're in a covenant relationship with him. But given that we're going to look at that next week, that's probably enough on that for now. But it's what's important to grasp here at this moment is that we are called to be obedient, not so that we might be blessed, but rather so that we might be a blessing. That leads us into the final point here, which is the future. Covenant is about the future, and this passage in particular is about the future and what God's people will be. Look at verses 5 and 6 again. Now, if you obey me and fully, uh, fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. God wants his people to be holy, obedient and faithful to him, not so he can bless them, but so that through them he can bless the world. Did you notice that? God has a mission and a task for his people. They are to be a kingdom of priests. As Moses is to Israel, Israel is to be to the world. Do you see? Moses was to bring the revelation of God to Israel, to make known God's purposes to Israel. And likewise, Israel is to play that role to the nations around them, to the world. They're to be a kingdom of priests. Of course, this has always been God's purposes in every covenant that he ever made. The first covenant he made in, in Genesis 12 with Abraham. He made a covenant with Abraham and he said, look, Abraham, I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you into a great nation. I'm going to bless you with the land. I'm going to, make, I'm going to bless the whole world through you. Those who bless you, I will bless. God always wants to take his people and bless the world through his people. You know, the, the Great Commission in Matthew 28, at the end of Matthew 28, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and behold, I'm with you to the very end of the age. The Great Commission doesn't come out of nowhere, out of uh, Matthew 28. It's got its roots right back there in Genesis 12. It's got its roots here in Exodus 19, where God wants to take his people and bless the world through them. He wants us to be a kingdom of priests for him. So what's true of Israel here is true for us today, this morning as well. We've been blessed by God so that we might be a blessing for others. So what does that look like today as we finish considering some ideas what does it mean for us to be God's faithful covenant people, a kingdom of priests to the world around us? How can we play our part in taking the good news of Jesus to others? There's two ways we, I'd like us to think about that. One of those is, is we do that corporately, as a church family together. Maybe we put on special services. Maybe we, we run special events. Maybe we, we do particular things we run a course and together as a church family we put things on it's called the gathered church when we gather as a church where we seek together to do just this to make Jesus known in the community around us we're doing some of those things already aren't we and, and we're going to do more of those things that's how we corporately together fulfill this mission that God has given the church but of course don't don't neglect to realise the other way in which we can make God known, which is in this passage, which is being his holy, obedient people to those around us who look on and say, wow, there is something different about these people. They are so gentle with one another. They are so patient with each other. They're full of peace and love and faithfulness and self-control. What is going on in their lives? I want to find out more about that. Corporately together. There's another way in which we can fulfill that, and that is individually, 
God calls us individually to fulfill this task as well. Now, this isn't going to be a surprise to many of you, but I am not the best-placed person to make Jesus known to your family and friends, neighbours and colleagues. There's someone who's even better placed than I am to do that. And that, of course, is you. God has given us all our individual, particular locations and communities that we live in. Our own neighbours, our own families, our own colleagues, our own friends. And of course, corporately, together, we can invite people to events, but God wants us individually as well to be speaking for Jesus to those we know so that they can know his blessing. That's what it's all about, isn't it? God has made a, a blessed people to bless others. Well, however it is that we're involved in this task that God sets us, God wants us to be involved in his mission for the world. Just like in Exodus here, he has saved us. He is calling us to be faithfully obedient. And he will be with us as we take his good news to the world around us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we praise you for the foreshadowing of the gospel we see in Exodus. We praise you that we rest secure in our relationship of love with you, not on anything we do, but on what you have done for us, supremely in your death and resurrection. Lord, your love is proclaimed to us. Lord, we, we pray that by your Spirit you would help us respond to that love with faithful obedience to you. Just as a faithful, good child longs to, to, to support and, and obey their parents. Lord, may we do so with our Heavenly Father. And Lord, be, be with us by your Spirit as you make us to be a kingdom of priests to the world around us so that your blessing wouldn't just stop with us but would flow through us to those we love. In Jesus' name, amen.